Hi, everybody, and welcome to Industrial Organization. So this is going to be uh, a playlist for an I.O. class. My name is Liam Malloy. I'm a professor here at the University of Rhode Island. And um, we're just going to go chapter by chapter. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about you know why I like teaching IO in in this video and give a brief introduction to the course. Uh, the book we're going to use is uh, this one here, New Perspectives on Industrial Organization by Tremblay and Tremblay. It's a pretty standard book. I like it um, mostly because of the level of math. So IO uh, can be a fairly technical undergraduate course. Um, we're going to use a little bit of calculus. Uh, the last video here in chapter one will be a math review. It's not too bad, um, but if you are, you know, taking it, expect to, you know, do a little bit of math. And especially if you haven't had intermediate micro yet, you might experience uh, some, you know, a little bit more technical side of things. So let's go here. Um, industrial organization is kind of a an odd name for the course. Uh, if you take an industrial organization course in in like the College of Business or something, it's going to be something very different. Uh, you know, it might be a better term these days to call it like market organization or market competition. Um, industry, you know, is really about manufacturing, and of course, manufacturing was the original focus of industrial organization. But now, as the United States and other advanced economies uh, produce, you know, less manufactured goods and more service goods and services. Uh, we want to expand our definition and look at, you know, lots of different types of markets, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, restaurants or financial services or entertainment. We want to be able to, you know, talk about all sorts of markets in IO. Um, and so as we'll, you know, talk about and as we'll see, you know, one way we can think of industrial organization is filling in the spots between perfect competition and monopoly that you may have uh, studied in you know intermediate micro or principles of micro and so really what it is is the economics of imperfect competition um, and you know if you did do intermediate micro you've probably done you know at least the chapter on oligopoly and price competition and so we're going to fill in those details and do a lot more models and that's another reason I like this textbook is it covers all of the standard models while also being pretty heavy on game theory which is really important to IO and the sort of slightly newer behavioral economics uh, which we want to think about when we think about things like advertising um, you know, various uh, forms of products and how firms will use that to guide uh, consumers to a specific product. Um, so we'll talk about all of that, you know, as we go along in, in this um, course. So let's think about sort of four broad questions that we want to answer in industrial organization. And, and the first one is, you know, do firms have market power? You know, if the answer is no, then we can stop right here and just think about perfect competition. So obviously the answer is, is going to be yes. And then the question is, well, why do firms have market power, right? How do they acquire market power? How do they maintain market power? Is it something that we want to worry about? Um, should we have, you know, competition policy that limits market power? Um, should we have, you know, competition policy that, you know, thinks about the difference between sort of, you know, static market power versus dynamic market power, right? And I think that's going to be really important. You know, if market power is temporary because firms have come up with a really good product or service, um, then that's different than if firms are maintaining their market power over time um, and using that market power in ways to limit competition. Um, and so I think thinking about public pol policy is going to be really important. And I think if we want to just sort of have a s quick definition of market power, it's really the ability to set prices above cost, right? So that you're earning, you know, not only an accounting profit where accounting revenue is larger than accounting cost, but an economic profit where you're earning, you know, revenue above, you know, sort of total costs, including opportunity costs. And in that case, we could say that a firm has market power. And if a firm has market power for a long time, then that's definitely something that we might want to worry about. So this book uses what they what is sort of known in the 
uh, field as structure conduct performance or SCP paradigm. Um, so we want to think about a number of things, right? We want to think about demand, which is going to include, you know, the price elasticity of demand, which will affect firms' abilities to mark up. Um, we want to think about things that affect that elasticity, including substitutes and complements, um, and, you know, whether there's a sort of cyclical character of demand um, or not even just a cyclical character, right? But, you know, whether there's um, a piece of demand that increases with innovations and then decreases over time as competition increases. We want to think about costs, right? So the role of technology and input prices. Um, and, you know, we have various cost structures that will lend themselves more or less to, you know, monopoly or perfect competition and somewhere in between. And so then we want to talk about sort of the SCP, so the market structure. Um, the number and size of firms. So we'll talk about, you know, a Corneau model where we can have two firms um, in an oligopoly or, you know, 10 firms in an oligopoly and see how that uh, affects it. Um, we'll see the difference between sort of a Corneau and Bertrand model there. We want to think about product differentiation, not only sort of on a uh, vertical dimension where we have, you know, higher quality and lower quality products, but also on a horizontal dimension where, you know, the quality might be more or less the same, but uh, we have, you know, some aspects of a product that uh, are more, you know, attractive to some consumers and other uh, attributes that are more attractive to other consumers. Um, we think about entry and exit barriers. So is it easy to uh, enter a market? Um, so, you know, some economists have said, you know, as long as firms can enter a market easily, then we don't really have to worry. So we'll talk about that. Um, and then we'll talk about integration, right? So both horizontal and vertical integration. And then we want to think about what firms do, right? Their conduct. And so uh, how do they price things? How do they design their product? You know, mergers and acquisitions. Advertising, which I think is a, fa a fascinating topic, right? And very relatable to behavioral economics. Um, I always tell, when I teach behavioral economics, I always say you can use it for good or evil, right? You can use it for good and trying to make things better for consumers, or you can become uh, a marketer. <laughs> um, we'll also think about research and development, right? Because that goes back to product differentiation um, as well as technology, right? So, you know, if firms uh, are uh, investing a lot in R&D, then they have the ability to improve their products. They have the ability to improve their processes. Um, so we'll talk about that. And then we want to talk about performance, right? So is a firm profitable? You know, are they just earning the same profit as firms, you know, across the economy? Do they have uh, a especially high profit? We'll talk about static efficiency versus dynamic efficiency. Uh, and then we'll talk about sort of what the goals of public policy should be. Should they be, you know, equity? Should they be stability? So we'll talk about that. Um, so is there market power? I mean, I think we could say uh, in, in a lot of areas there are, right? There is market power. Uh, some, you know, markets have more or less market power. You know, if you're producing a commodity, you're going to tend to have less market power. If you're producing a very differentiated good, then you'll have more market power. So, you know, if you have something like the iPhone, uh, then... You, you will tend to have more market power than if you are, you know, growing corn. Um, so what we want to do is we want to look at that. Uh, we want to look at revenue versus cost. That can be very difficult, right? Because, you know, we often don't have good data on marginal costs. Uh, so we have to rely on average costs. Average costs and marginal costs can vary substantially, right? So if you're the U.S. airline industry, uh, you have these huge fixed costs and at least until the plane is full, you have very, very low marginal costs. Um, but of course, you have to price at at least average cost in order to stay in business. And so in, in an industry like the airline industry, market structure is going to be very important um, and can you know spell the difference between profitability and bankruptcy. So. We want to think about, you know, how they maintain market power, right? We could have legal protection, things like uh, patents and copyrights, um, firm strategy. So, you know, whether that's bundling um, or, you know, 
R&D and new products? Um, and then how do they maintain market power, right? And so this is really the question we want to think about because we want firms in some ways to make the investments to get market power. We just don't want them to be able to maintain market power too long. And so we're our public policy is always sort of trying to balance on the knife's edge of encouraging enough you know, innovation that we get better and cheaper products uh, and uh, helping consumers get those better and cheaper products at closer to marginal cost. And so we'll talk about that a fair amount in, in this um, course. Uh, so one, you know, product that has been talked about a lot fairly recently, or maybe not so recently anymore, but is the EpiPen. Um, the EpiPen is old technology. Uh, it's hugely important. So it has a very inelastic uh, demand curve. Um, obviously, if you don't need it, you don't want to pay for one at all, pretty much. But if you do need it, you're willing to pay a lot. Um, and so, you know, the market structure here is going to be very important. If there's only one firm that produces it, then they're going to be able to charge a lot, as we have seen. Um, and so what do we want to do about that, you know, in terms of public policy? Uh, insulin is another uh, product that has been in the news a lot where, you know, it's vitally important to those who need it. They have a very inelastic demand curve. Uh, but we also, you know, if there's not a lot of competition in producing it, um, then the price can be very high. And if there is competition, then that can be an issue, right? Because then all of a sudden prices will drop to marginal cost, potentially, uh, depending on how that market works. And then those firms might, you know, not have a huge incentive to produce it. So... When we think about market power, that, you know, the, the downside of market power is that consumers are paying higher prices, which we don't like. The upside of market power is that firms have, you know, an incentive to, to produce these goods and services. Uh, we want to think about sort of both allocative efficiency, so people who are paying more than they should be versus productive inefficiency, um, and whether or not firms have that uh you know, incentive to innovate. Um, and then the sort of worst part of a lot of market power is rent seeking, right? So if you have a lot of market power, then you want to do a lot to protect it. One of the things that you can do is lobby, you know, the political process, um, which is a very sort of inefficient use from an economics point of view uh, of your resources, but can be a very efficient use of resources from the firm's point of view. And so that's something that we might want public policy to uh, limit. So we're going to stop there. Um, we'll continue the introduction uh, in the next video. And then, as I said, the last video for chapter one will be uh, a math review. So if you're feeling like you need a little bit of math review, check that one out. Um, they'll all be in the same uh, playlist for industrial organization. All right.